Hello, welcome to our semiconductor education program. This is Vincent Chan. Today we are going to continue our lesson on the stability and the Miller compensation, and focus on how to solve the poles and the zero for the Miller compensation. Stability and the Miller compensation, part two. Poles and the zero solved. This is the circuit I presented in the previous lecture, which shows a multi-stage amplifier, a compensated. Because why? Because CC is now the compensation capacitor is connected across the feedback path between the output and the input of the gain stage. Right? This is called a Miller compensation. So multi-stage amplifier, differential stage, gain stage, and the upper stage. Let's focus on the gain stage. So for the gain stage, at the input side of the gain stage, you see the total resistance and capacitance, R, R1 and the C1 respectively. And the total capacitance and the total resistance at the upper stage of the gain stage, the upper side of the gain stage, R, the C2, and the R2. Right. So the CC is connected between the across between the base and the collector of the bipolar junction transistor. The GM represents the transconductance. So how to solve this? So what's the question? To harness the Miller compensation. You gotta know after, because before, remember, before we compensate this, before CC is connected. There are two poles. The original uncompensated amplifier, the original pole one, the first pole, R1C1, one over R1C1. Original um, second pole is decided by the R2C2, right? But after, this is the FP1, FP2. But after you connect a CC, then the both poles got, got what? Got shaken, got moved. Because why? Because feedback. Feedback. That means what? The first pole is, is here. R1, C1. R2, C2. Because you connect the feedback. means both time constants got affected. Both time constants are effective. So both poles are shaken. So you got to know how to... So where, where they are moving? Where to where? Where are the new poles? Derivation. So we have to start with the transfer function. So we have to start with the transfer function. So before we start, I encourage you to, to maybe try to pause and answer the question. So where are the new first pole located? Where is the new second pole located? Just answer this question. Think about this question. So before we move on, I, I, I urge you to think about this, because this is, because without, because if, if you're going to answer this question, you're going to, you, you don't know how to, to handle. So the first level is you got to know the circuit level, the where's the pole, and then I'll build on this, then you talk about, think about the compensation, right? So here's what we're going to do. You solve the base node. You see the three current, right? The sum of the three current equals I1. Why? Because kick off current law. The incoming current I01 equals the purple plus pink plus the blue. Right? So the incoming current I01 equals the purple V pi R1. Pink SC pi S C1 times V pi. And then the blue current is the voltage between base and the collector divided by 1 over SCC, right? And then this is the first equation. And the second equation is based on the node equation at the collector node. So the blue current is incoming, coming in, equals 3 coming out. So coming in, the blue, equals the first coming out, GMV pi, 
The second coming out of the green current, VO2 divided by R2. The last one, yeah, HC2 times VO2. Then what? Then you bring back the previous equation. This is the setup equation. You try to eliminate what? Useless the V pi. V pi is just the bridge. So we bring these two equations to us to solve these two equations simultaneously and eliminate the V pi. Now what do you see? What do you see? So you can try to solve this by yourself. I'm gonna I'm not gonna show you the detail. I just want to want you to hold down the concept, the big picture. Okay? So then you try to solve the transfer function or trans. Resistance. Why I say the trans resistance? So trans resistance means what? If it's voltage in, the current out is transconductance. Now it's the current in, voltage out. So it's trans resistance. VO2 divided by IO1. So eliminate V pi will give you this. It's kind of intimidating. I'll give you this. This is the precise, exact transfer function. So it tells you one, zero, and two poles. One, zero, and two poles. So one, zero, and two poles. Zero frequency. For the zero frequency, where's the zero frequency? Let's focus on the numerator. So R1, R2, let's cover. We'll take out. Then what do you see? Negative GM corresponds to the negative GM. Or the negative GM in the original equation got pulled out. Then what do you see? you see the omega hz, you see this, right? So if you compare, correspond, link this red highlight together, then you solve the high frequency, zero frequency. You, you got the zero frequency transconductance divided by compensating capacitor, okay? Transconductance divided by the compensating capacitor. So this, this lecture, we're going to focus more on the, the pole frequency, because the key is the pole. But in the CMOS, the zero is going to play a very, very important role. Okay? So in the coming lecture, then you, especially when I teach you the CMOS operational amplifier, this zero frequency is going to play a very, very important role. So at that, at so in the future lecture, I'm going to teach you so how to use the analysis by inspection to quickly capture the zero frequency. But I'm not going to throw all the detail within one lecture, OK? Let's go. Let's learn one. Uh, let's learn gradually. Don't, try, don't just, no, I think it's just too overwhelmed for you to, to take all the stuff in, OK? Let's focus on, because the conversation is, I, I, I said both poles are shaken, right? Where we are moving? Where we are? The new pole are located. Let's change the symbol a little bit. Becomes the omega HP one prime. Pay attention to the detail. Prime omega HP two prime. So how to solve the prime denominator, right? How to solve this? It's crazy. If you solve this second order equation, you we got to, we got to have some some sort of skill. So this is how we are going to do. We assume, because it's very likely the, dom the new dominant pole is going to show up. If you really learn something from so-called pole shifting compensation, so it, come, it becomes um, it's more kind of intuitive to make this assumption. You simply assume. I just throw a question out. So how are we going to solve this? It's crazy, right? It's intimidating. Are you going to, to, 
to list the two equations, blue equals blue, red equals red, and solve these two variable simultaneously? Yes, maybe. Yeah, I have students do this. Sometimes they sum submit the homework. Usually, I, I know they, they cannot finish in one row. They have to turn. Omega HP and blah, 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 blah equals. And their math is good. But engineering matters approximations sometimes more. Sometimes engineering values approximation more. So how to solve this? Actually, two minutes ago, I already gave you the answer. Okay? I already gave you a hint. So go back here. Pause. Five minutes. Try to figure out the omega HP1 prime and the omega HP2 prime. The two new dump, the two new pole frequencies. So I'll be back in five minutes. Did you get it? Two minutes before we pass, I said, it's very likely there exists a new dominant pole, which means it's quite intuitive and reasonable to assume both new poles got separated further, got separated further. Especially if, if you have learned the various techniques around the frequency comp compensation. Almost every time we need sort of a new dominant pole. Shows up. So if this is true, then don't worry. Just kick out the second term. Just compare, just take the whole blues, the inverse of the whole blue as the first pole frequency. Nice and easy. Nice and easy, right? Aha! And then what? Then you throw this back. Because you got the omega, the, you, you got one already. And then you plug this into the red term, then you get the second pole frequency. <laughs> and also let me remind you, maybe you met this It's fantastic. You have fantastic mathematical problem solving skill. But let me remind you, engineering sometimes values approximation more, right? So with your fantastic, math skill, you might be challenging this, you said, sir, this is obviously, there's a flaw, right? Why? How come you plug the omega HP1 prime into the second order coefficient and you got this kind of simple result? It should be as complicated as the first one, right? This is why we still play a little bit trick approximation. Let me ask you, there are five terms in the denominator of the omega HP1 prime, right? But which one is dominate? Maybe your instinct is the one with the four. C, C, G, M, R, R, 2, Y. Because four. No way. 
No way. What kind of answer is this? Differential. Be, be, more, be a little bit more professional, okay? I'm really laughing. <laughs> it just reminded me <laughs> the real situation, learning environment in the physical classroom. When I play this as student, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> differential gain stage and up stage gain. What do you mean by the gain? How big? What, what's the gain? Gm times r two. Okay, it could be one hundred, five hundred, eight hundred. GM transconductance times the resistance, the gain, the keyword is G A I N. Just take this out, just put down this on your note. Okay, gain. So you see the four, or the term with the four, there's an embedded gain, GMR2. So the middle term, CCGM, our R2 could be higher than the rest of the four terms by 500 times. Okay, so when you calculate the second pole frequency, you can just kick out the rest of the four and just focus on the one I just mentioned. Okay, anyway, so now you see the gain. So which means what? The omega HP one prime is really small. So this result also supporting. This, the original assumption. So you start with the assumption, and then you get the result. And the examining, investigative result, you find out the assumption makes sense, reasonable. So this is sort of a self-consistent approximation. So the trick lies on the self-consistent approximation. And then we play this trick in other courses, other lectures as well. For example, this is the MOSFET the common source amplifier, the high frequency response, right? So high frequency response on the right, low frequency response on the left hand side. If we want to investigate the high, investigate the high frequency response of this amplifier, I just want to make a quick connection between the Miller and this one, okay? So quite similar, right? So CGD is the feedback. So it, you, you write down these two equation, very similar, and you get this similar outcome. Two poles and one zero. Two poles and one zero. And then where is the two poles frequency located? Same thing. You make the assumption, similar assumption, and you get this, and this, and they support the omega HP1 much less than omega HP2. Self-consistent approximation, all right? So the key major takeaway of this lecture, how to solve the pole frequency, okay? This, we assume this, and we get this, and go back to support the original assumption. We use the self-consistent technique. But unfortunately, when it comes to real problem solving, so with this kind of knowledge, sometimes it's still not enough. So that's why I designed the third lecture around the Miller compensation, and focus on the problem solving I'm gonna show you a design example, how to really apply this to tackle a design problem. So this is the lecture I'm going to teach you in the next one. Thanks for watching.